This is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over atrial septal defects. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over pediatric nursing. And as always, after you watch this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. What is an atrial septal defect? This is where there is a hole in the intraatrial septum. And what this does is it creates a connection between the upper chambers of the heart which are the right atrium and the left atrium. And after birth, there should not be a connection between these two chambers. Now, according to the CDC.gov, one in every 770 babies born in the United States will have an atrial septal defect. And why is this a problem? Why do we not want a person to have an atrial septal defect? Well, small ASCs, just a little opening in this area that separates your right atrium from your left atrium, really doesn't cause a lot of problems because it's not allowing a lot of blood to flow from the left atrium to the right atrium. But when you get a large ASC, a large hole in that intraatrial septum, we get problems. And what happens is it creates a left to right shunt. So blood on the left side of the heart is actually going to shunt over to the right side of the heart, which is going to deliver too much blood to the lungs. So you're gonna have increased blood flow to the lungs. And over time, a little bit later on for that patient, depending on how big it is and everything that's going on with them, they will start to develop complications such as heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and they have an increased risk of stroke. And whenever we go over the pathophysiology here in a moment, you're gonna see why they're at risk for these conditions. Now, if it's left untreated, the pulmonary hypertension, the heart failure, it can lead to an irreversible complication called Eisenmenger syndrome. And this is where the blood will actually reverse its shunting from that left to right to right to left, which is gonna to lead to cyanotic problems. Now let's quickly talk about the different types of ASDs. And the type really depends on where that hole is located within that atrial septum. So when you're studying for exams, try to remember the location of the hole based on what type it is. So the first type I want to talk about is the most common type of ASD, and it's called ostium secundum. And these holes are found in the middle of this atrial septum. Another type is ostium primum, and these holes are found in the bottom of the atrial septum, close to the atrioventricular valves. And the atrioventricular valves separate our atrium from our ventricles. And what were those again? They are our tricuspid valve and our bicuspid valve, which is the mitral valve. So the holes will be close to those locations. Another type is called sinus venosus, and these holes are found close to the superior vena cava and the right atrium, so that's where they will be located. Now let's go over the pathophysiology of an atrial septal defect. And to help us truly understand what is going on with the blood flow in an ASD, we first have to understand normal heart blood flow. So let's quickly go over that. Okay, well you have the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. They each have their own mission. The right side of the heart's goal is to get blood to the lungs to get it oxygenated because it just received blood throughout the body, venous blood that's exhausted and it needs to be reoxygenated. The left side of the heart takes blood from the lungs that's been oxygenated and its goal is to pump it throughout your body to replenish all those vital organs so you can keep living. So it all begins on the right side. Blood enters in the right side through the superior and inferior vena cava, goes in at the right atrium. Then your tricuspid valve is going to open and allow to drain down into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to squeeze it up through the pulmonic valve, which is going to open and allow it to go through the pulmonary artery into the lungs, and then gas exchange is going to occur in the lungs. Then after gas exchange has occurred, the blood is going to flow into the left side of the heart through the pulmonary vein. It's going to go into the left atrium. Your bicuspid mitral valve is going to open up, go down into the left ventricle, and that left ventricle is strong. And it is going to squeeze that blood up through the aortic valve and then through the aorta and throughout rest of the body. Now there's a couple of things I want to point out about the heart, which will help us understand ASCs. First of all, 
after birth, after a person is born and they're using their lungs, the pressure on the left side of the heart is greater than the pressure on the right side of the heart. Now, why is that? Well, the left side has a more intense jaw. It has to pump all that blood that's just been oxygenated throughout the system. So it has to be stronger than the right side. The right side just has to get that blood to the lungs. However, in utero, when a fetus is still in its mama's belly, what happens is that the pressure is equal on both sides because that baby is not using its lungs. And there is an actual connection that naturally is occurring between the right atrium and the left atrium. And the connection is through what's called the foramen ovale. So it's normal. We actually, in a sense, want a hole in the heart whenever the baby is in its mama's belly still because the reason for that is because the lungs aren't working. The baby is receiving oxygen from the placenta. So really, the right side of the heart isn't needing to do its job just yet by getting the blood to the lungs because the lungs aren't working. So it's okay for that blood that comes in through the right side to be shunted over to the left side to go through the body in a fetus through that foramen ovale. Now, after that baby is born, it starts to breathe on its own. And whenever it does that, it changes the pressure in the heart. The pressure on the right side is going to decrease. So whenever that happens, over that frame in ovale is like a piece of tissue, and when that pressure happen, change happens, when that baby starts breathing on its own, it's gonna seal over that frame in ovale. So it closes shortly after birth. Now, in some people, this doesn't occur, and a lot of people don't even know it. They don't really have signs and symptoms or anything like that, and they have what's called a patent frame in ovale. We call it a PFO. And so they have this hole in their heart. So a PFO is another type of hole that can occur in the atrial septum. Now the problem with a PFO is that it can increase the risk of a stroke. And I have seen this in patients. Patients been admitted, has had a stroke. They're not really sure the source or what caused the stroke. Well, they do an echocardiogram and they look and they actually can see that this patient does have a patent foramen ovale, a PFO, and that's where the stroke came from. So now let's look at the blood flow with someone who has, let's say, a large atrial septal defect. As I pointed out before, the small ones really don't cause that much of a problem because the opening is so small and it's not allowing a lot of blood to shunt from the left to the right. But large holes do allow major shunting to occur. So why is shunting even occurring? Well, it goes back to that pressure um, differences between the left and the right side. The left side has greater pressure on it compared to the right side. So if you have this person that has a large hole in this intraatrial septum, whenever systole occurs, when the heart is pumping, this ventricle is contracting, it's going to naturally shunt blood from that uh, left atrium to the right atrium. It's just gonna go to that lower pressure gradient. All that blood's gonna be coming over. Now that's an issue because the blood that's on the left side has already been on the right side. So you're gonna have all this extra blood coming over from the left atrium to the right atrium. And the right side of the heart is not made to carry and pump extra blood volume. So what it's going to do is it's going to stress our atrium and really our right ventricle out because the right ventricle is going to have to take more blood volume to pump it to the lungs. So over time, it's going to start enlarging. Now, that is going to lead to more blood flow going to our lungs and our lungs can only handle so much blood. So over time, what's gonna happen is that to compensate, number one, it's gonna start narrowing its arteries that feed the lungs. In addition, those arteries will narrow because they're becoming damaged from all that extra blood. So you're gonna have narrowing of the arteries to the lungs that feed the lungs, and it's gonna create a condition called pulmonary hypertension. Now this is going to occur over time. So whenever pulmonary hypertension occurs, 
that's going to lead to some other issues. Number one, this child, this person can have issues with recurrent lung infections. They'll have a lot of congestion in their lungs and that will lead to that. In addition, it's going to stress the heart out even more because not only did you have your right ventricle pumping extra blood volume causing it to enlarge, but now, because we have narrowing of those arteries of the lungs, the right ventricle is going to have to pump against more resistance to even get that blood to the lungs. The heart can only do this for so long, and the person can enter into what's called heart failure, where the heart literally just becomes so weak, and it just doesn't pump, so blood is going to start back flowing, and you're going to have a lot of issues. Infants can have issues feeding, and this will lead to issues with their growth, they'll have failure to thrive, they'll have activity intolerance, decreased cardiac output, so you're gonna get decreased blood flow to the brain, to the kidneys, to all those important structures that can start suffering as well. In addition, the person can start developing dysrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, a flutter, and they are at risk for stroke. Now, if you watch my other video on ventricular septal defects, you'll notice that a lot of these complications are, are sort of the same because you have that same concept of that left to right shunting occurring. But one thing that's a little bit different with an ASD than a VSD is the increased stroke risk. Now, why is that? Well, in your veins, clots form sometimes. And normally that clot that has formed in the vein will travel It'll go from the right side and go to the lungs and it'll be there. But if we have a hole in this right atrium and we have a clot that comes in through our venous circulation, that hole just is really inviting for that clot to just cross over. So you have a clot that just crosses over into the left side and then we're in big trouble because what does that left side do? Left side pumps blood throughout the system. So that clot can cross over, go through the left side, go up through the body and travel throughout the body and go to the brain. So then you have a clot in the vessels that feed your brain tissue. That's going to block blood flow to the brain tissue causing a stroke. So that is definitely a risk with these conditions with a large ASD. And we talked about Eisenmenger syndrome. This is where over time, if this um, ASD is not corrected, the large one that is allowing this pulmonary hypertension to occur, leading to heart failure, all of this, this is actually going to change the way that the shunting occurs and it's going to lead to reversal of shunting. So then you'll have right to left shunting of blood. So what's going to happen is that you're going to have the unoxygenated blood now actually going into the left side. So all of it's going to be going here and then it's going to go up through the system and our body, our tissues does, don't like um, unoxygenated blood. So that's going to lead to a lot of cyanotic problems, low oxygen in the blood, clubbing of the fingers and things like that. And once that occurs, it is rare to occur curb because treatment can be done for this, but it is irreversible. Now let's talk about signs and symptoms of an ASD. Okay, some things I want you to keep in mind about signs and symptoms is number one, the severity of the symptoms and when the symptoms will actually present depends on the size of that hole that's in that septum. So the larger the hole, the more severe the symptoms are going to be, the earlier they're going to come on and lead to those complications compared to a smaller one. And also signs and symptoms usually don't present at birth, but a little bit later on in childhood or even adulthood. And usually what happens is that they have a heart murmur that someone notices and they do an echocardiogram, which is an echo, which is like an ultrasound of the heart and they can look at the heart and see that structure. So keep that in mind as we're talking about signs and symptoms. And to help us remember our signs and symptoms, let's remember the word holes. And for our VSD or ventricular um, septal defect video, a lot of these signs and symptoms are going to match up because you have that left to right shunting that's occurring. And the only thing that's really changing is are our heart sounds and the risk for stroke with this condition. So H, heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. And how, what you're going to see with that 
is you're gonna see decreased cardiac output, the heart's weak, the lungs are being affected, which in turn is gonna lead you to see the patient's gonna have difficulty breathing, they're gonna fatigue easily with activity, the child, infant may have trouble feeding, they just don't feel like feeding. Uh, when you listen to lung sounds, if the, the hyper, if the heart failure is severe enough, they can have crackles, edema, swelling in the extremities. They can also experience this like cold, clammy, sweating with activity. Again, that's from that decreased cardiac output. So in nursing diagnosis realm, you may want to be thinking about activity intolerance, decreased cardiac output, excessive fluid volume from everything that's going on with that ASD. Okay, O for often experiences lung infections. That's from that congestion with the lungs, what's going on in there. Perfect place for an infection to set up. And nursing diagnosis, be thinking risk for infection. So be monitoring them for that. L would be low growth rate. And that's going to trace back to their inability to feed properly. They are literally just tired, exhausted. Their heart's not working the way it should. Breathing issues. And... Plus, their body requires a lot more calories to, uh, for the heart to pump, for the breathing, so that's burning more calories and they're not taking it in, so they can have issues with their growth. And then E, extra heart sounds. What you can hear with this is what's called a mid-systolic heart murmur, or also called a systolic ejection murmur. And what this is from is that you have this increased blood flow going through this pulmonic valve, which is right here that leads to the pulmonary artery where that blood's gonna go into the lungs. And the reason for that is because, remember, you have that shunting of that blood from left to right, so you have all this extra blood volume going through that pulmonic valve, which is creating this murmur. And you can hear it at that second intercostal space in the upper left part of the sternal border. And how this will sound is that you will hear the murmur, it will be low at the beginning of systole, it will increase mid-systole, and then decrease at the end of systole, hence why it's called a mid-systolic murmur. In addition, the S2 will be wide and with fixed splitting. And this is because that pulmonic valve is slowing down and how it's closing. So that is why you're hearing S2 that way. In addition, we already talked about this in depth, there is a risk for stroke. Now let's go over the nursing interventions and treatments for an ASD. Now with ASDs, as I've pointed out, the large ones are the ones that really cause the issues. The small ones are typically monitored. A lot of times they go undetected because they really don't lead to as many problems compared to the large one. So treatments include monitoring those, diuretics may be ordered if heart failure is presenting and you have this fluid overload with the heart being weak, they can do that to remove extra fluid. Surgery can be performed to actually close this hole. Open heart can be performed. And um, this is usually done early in childhood before school age, or they can do that with a heart cath, close it that way. But it really depends again what type of ASC this is, the size, and so forth. And to help diagnose an ASC, as I pointed out earlier, they can do an echocardiogram. And this is very non-invasive. This is where they just take an ultrasound of the heart, look at those structures, how it's pumping. They can tell a lot through an echo and assess this ASD. Now, from nursing standpoint, you wanna be thinking in the realm with these large ASCs that are causing these complications. So we're gonna be looking at nutrition because they have low growth rate. They may be a candidate for a feeding tube where they can get extra nutrition if this ASC is causing problems with them to feed. We wanna also monitor that heart rhythm because it can cause atrial fibrillation, a fib, looking at that looking at their respiratory status, listening to those lung sounds. Are you hearing crackles? And um, seeing, do they have infection? Because they're at risk for infection, so we wanna do infection prevention, educating the patient, if they're old enough, or the parents about vaccines to prevent those respiratory illnesses that can occur because they're more susceptible 
front for that if they develop pulmonary hypertension, monitoring weight. So thinking of those nursing diagnoses that I was going over, like activity intolerance, decreased cardiac output, excessive fluid volume, risk for infection, all those we're gonna be looking at for a patient with a large ASD. Okay, so that wraps up this video over atrial septal defects. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.